Okay, I think uh, we should start now as uh, shortly after uh, five. I welcome all um, who are joining us to the third webinar of the West Coast section of the EANS. Um, again, I'm quite happy that we found a well-known speaker for giving the talk. Um, today, um, Professor Gruber from Linz, Austria, We'll give a talk on the multi-modality management of zero aneurysms. I truly believe that's a very interesting topic. Um, he will give the talk for five, 45 minutes. And after the talk, we will have, um, let's say 15, 20 minutes for discussion. I would um, appreciate if you could put your question into the um, FMA section and then I can read them and not using the chat for answer for for um, for the questions. Uh, it makes it a bit more easier for me. So, Andreas, I'm happy that you're here, and uh, we Hi. are uh, appreciating to hear your talk. Please. Thank you very much. Um, uh, as you hear from my voice, I'm I'm a little bit um. My, my nose is closed, so I will probably interrupt a couple of times to 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 clean it. I hope you apologize. I'm I'm far away from you, so there is no way of contracting anything. Okay, okay great. So let's share my screen uh, and I I give you this presentation. Um, well, the, the bottom line, yeah. So. Uh, I always start the presentations with, with this slide. Um, this is all boring because you all know it, yeah? but I think there's a lot of information on, on this slide. On, on the left-hand side, you see that um, uh, aneurysm treatment um, is, is, is uh, that th th there are many ways to, to do. And this um, clip versus coil debate um, is more or less um, insufficient because there are so many more possibilities. The bottom line is that there are reconstructive and deconstructive um, uh, procedures. And you see reconstructive means that you occlude the aneurysm, but the parent artery stays open. This is clipping, this is coiling, this is anything like stenting. And you see that clipping, coiling, stenting are, physiologically speaking, in, in the same category. This is reconstructive. And then um, you have the deconstructive procedures. There are, of course, the minority, like parent artery occlusion, like parent artery occlusion with a bypass and so forth. So you occlude the aneurysm together with a parent artery. So this is a strategy that you usually cannot get along with in the brain, so only under, under certain, certain circumstances. On the right side, you see that um, when you apply those six uh, procedures, so clipping, coiling, stenting, and, and deconstructive procedures, you have a, a whole lot of, of, of uh, clinical and anatomical scenarios um, that more or less um, determine which procedure is, is feasible and which is, 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 is contraindicated. It means you have small-based, broad-based aneurysms, patients with and without subarachnoid hemorrhage, those with intracranial um, uh, intracerebral hemorrhages. You have um, uh, patients with difficult um, uh, angiomorphology, like old people with hostile or aortic arches. You have um, uh, patients with comorbidities. You have poor grade or, or, or good grade patients. You have aneurysms in the anterior and, and posterior circulation. You have vasospasm or not. And this dictates, of course, uh, which, which uh, treatment technique makes sense and which does not make sense. So you will not. You will not coil an aneurysm only because it's small based when you have an intracranial hemorrhage. Um, you will not do extensive surgery in, in an old patient with comorbidity or in, in, in a patient with a vasospasm. You will not stand the patient um, uh, after subarachnoid hemorrhage um, uh, because you might need external ventricular drainages or, or pressure probes, and then the patient is under double antipleted medication. You will not occlude an artery, parent artery occlusion, in a patient with, with subarachnoid hemorrhage because later when, when the Vasospasm takes over. I mean, all the collaterals that might have, have functioned on day one, they will no longer function on day ten. So there are many things to be to be considered. 
when we start now, uh, the, 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 the underlying um, idea is the following. Surgery is trauma, and this is what the endovascular people argue when they say you should embolize aneurysms. Of course, some endovascular complications are at least as traumatic um, uh, because you, you have no way to, to properly handle them. Hemorrhage is hemorrhage. And of course, some um, retreatment, repeated retreatment, um, if, if the first treatment is inappropriate, is also tra uh, trauma and, and also carries a certain morbidity. So in my understanding, there is no such correlation like minimal invasiveness justifies minimal effectiveness. Yeah? And it also does not say that maximal invasiveness like surgery guarantees maximal effectiveness. But of course, it, it does not mean that minimal invasive coiling justifies minimal effective results. Of course not. Yeah? That means when we talk about clipping, um, I, I just sh show you some very, let's say, um, aggressive cases, or um, let's say cases um, with, with large aneurysms and so forth. Because the, the, the common saying, of course, goes that um, everything can be coined, everything can be embolized. Well, that's true. But the question is, um, what is embolization? Uh, when when, uh, uh, when the, the person means everything can be embolized and, and he means you can put something into the aneurysm in every patient without hurting him, that's correct. Yeah? But when we talk about treatment, um, we talk about permanent, total angiographic obliteration of the aneurysm. Yeah? This is not stuffing something inside and running away, okay? Of course. So when you look at the, the, the challenging lesions, um, they are more or less the, the justification for surgery. And then of course you can come down to the smaller ones and then, then you can say, you can clip them, you can coil them, whatever. But there are lesions where you don't have so many options. Some, uh, you can y stand this patient, that's possible. You can bypass it, of course. Yeah. Um, you cannot coil it because the coils will more or less sink into the thrombus and it will recur forever. So it means you have a large aneurysm, you open it, you, 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 you do thrombectomy, you clip it and so forth. So this is the, the justification for the technique. And when you have smaller aneurysms, the same principles apply, mechanical aneurysm obliteration. To make it even worse, um, this does not only function in, in, in the elective cases, this also functions in the acute phases. And there is no way of, 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 of stenting or, or, or web implantation, whatever, you need to operate the patient. Yeah? That means the justification for, for, for the microsurgical procedure is always there. The question is uh, whether or not to clip or uh, surgically treat every aneurysm. Um, this is a, a matter of debate. But again, um, uh, only because you have a, a, a hammer, not everything is a nail. That means um, uh, I like this case report, or probably I, I dislike it. It's from Pittsburgh and it shows transphenoidal clipping of a small, broad, small, narrow necked SCA aneurysm. Yeah? So, again, yeah, um, uh, the, there is no correlation. The maximal invasiveness does not guarantee maximum um, effectiveness. So, you can easily stent it, um, uh, flow divert it, whatever. Yeah? There is no need to clip this through the nose. So, uh, more or less some uh, rational decision making, um, uh, like every one of us would do. On the other side, we, you know, the, the initial endovascular treatment form, this was coiling. You know, those pictures, um, uh, and you know, the, the game changing uh, thing with, with the coiling was that you could detach the coil. In the early 1990s, when you were placing coils and the coil didn't fit, you, you were an unlucky guy because the coil was out and then you had a stroke. The, the, the point is that, that when you have a coil that is melted um, uh, to a guide wire, and once the, the coil is inside the aneurysm, the coil fits, then you can, um, uh, by electrolysis or whatever, can detach the coil, control detection. That means that only when the coil fits, you can detach it. This was, of course, now the, 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 the revolution that, that made possible coiling of aneurysms. Now, uh, I usually show this, this uh, the next slide, just to more or less to, to illustrate um, uh, the difference um, uh, between um, uh, coiling um, and clipping from 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 a from a uh, mechanical standpoint. Um, uh, that means some um, uh, uh, clipping um, uh, does. Uh, sorry, I, I have to change this because um, uh, for one reason or another, the video doesn't start. But that. This is not shocking us. So I show this video uh, more or less to, to get a laugh. Yeah? 
but uh, it, it demonstrates the difference. Uh, on, on the upper left, you see um, uh, a clipped aneurysm. So the aneurysm blades um, reapproximate the, uh, the artery wall, and by doing so, they occlude the aneurysm using a, a defined mechanical force. Uh, here you see a, a coiled aneurysm, and you see that the coils induce thrombosis and endothelialization. And regardless how much you press the coils inside, um, Yeah, regardless how much you press the coils inside, as you can see on, on, the, on, on the lower left now, um, you will only uh, end up with roughly 20%, 30% of coils inside the aneurysm and the rest is thrombus. As you can see also on, on, on those surgical pictures where there is a lot of thrombus and not so many coils. That means, of course, this kind of occlusion is prone to recanalization. If thrombosis doesn't work or if, if there's a water hammer or something, uh, that means uh, five to 10% of, of coiled aneurysms may undergo recanalization, what is the major drawback, of course, of this technique, whereas um, the, the minimal invasiveness, of course, is, is brilliant. You see here a broad-based ACOM aneurysm, and you see at first sight that this is not treatable using um, uh, bare platinum coils, because coils um, lack what surgery has, and this is the, the so-called reconstructive capacity. That means when you have a, a clip, you can um, uh, model or, or tailor any kind of shape at the, at the neck. Whereas when you place coils, they only make a sphere and they include everything that is incorporated into the aneurysm. In this case, you see that the, the preclosal artery uh, taking off the, the aneurysm wall, and of course you would occlude it. To circumvent this complication uh, means that you need um, uh, Y stenting or X stenting or something, so more invasive procedures. And this now is, 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 is the crucial question. Um, aneurysm surgery has defined risks uh, and morbidities, um, uh, depending on aneurysm size, location, and so forth. But um, uh, depending on your experience, those risks are, are usually calculated. That means you, you, you know what you can do, and usually you will perform the way you perform. Placing uh, two stents in, in, into the ACOM, for example, uh, renders the patient uh, to, to uh, unpredictable risks, of course, uh, because you don't know how thrombosis will work. So, so placing flow diverters or, or stents has a, a still not um, a sufficiently manageable risk of, of, of ischemic complications from thrombosis and from, th from, from thromboemboli. And this, of course, is, is not there um, with, uh, with um, clipping. It means um, uh, uh, the, the trade-off usually is not some, uh, the, what is the, the more invasive procedure, but what is your morbidity and then and what is your effectiveness. We often hear that um, uh, aneurysms recur at the neck, but they rupture at the dome. So they say that neck remnants are benign lesions. As you can see here, this is again an ACOM aneurysm. And of course the neck remnant, um, uh, or the, the, the neck remnant that you saw here was thin walled, it was red, it, it was rupture prone. So in the vast majority, a neck remnant is, is a benign entity, but you can never foresee. When we talk about um, uh, aneurysm coiling, um, this is an, again an older paper of mine from, from, from Vienna. We looked at, 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 at many aneurysms and we looked at um, uh, how they used to recur. There are two ways and they, they make a, a, a significant difference. Way one, the aneurysm stays morpho morphologically speaking the same, but the coils recompact. And that means the aneurysm is stable, and when the coils recompact, you can recoil them. On the other hand, when the aneurysm grows, but the coil stays the same, that means that the aneurysm per se is an, is an unstable um, uh, lesion, so you should get rid of it by, by other means, like stenting, flow diversion, or clipping. That's a major difference in the, in the management algorithm. But I, I'm, I'm not, um, I'm, I'm not um, criticizing um, endovascular treatment um, uh, at all. Yeah? There are many lesions where you're very happy that this procedure is around and then and you would not like to, 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 to clip um, a basilar trunk fenestration. Any longer. So there are good reasons why, why this has been invented. Talking about ruptured aneurysms, so you know the ISO trial and uh, to the ISO trial, there are three very important, um, 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 let's say, um, Remarks. First, um, uh, the ISO trial says that um, in the acute phase, some um, embolized um, uh, ruptured aneurysms uh, fare better than clipped ones. Well, um, first, 
this uh, conclusion must not be extrapolated to unruptured lesions. It, it only holds true for ruptured lesions. There is no trial saying that it, you should embolize unruptured lesions. Second thing, and we were talking about, about the efficacy. Here you see that you can embolize everything, of course, but the question is, will, will it be stable or not? Third thing, and this is the most important thing, um, uh, the message of ISAT is not coil the ruptured aneurysms, but it says, when an aneurysm looks embolizable and it has ruptured, it should be embolized. When an aneurysm looks clippable and it is difficult to embolize, just by coins, you should clip it. And when the surgeon and the radiologist meet and, and when they look at the case and both say what to do, no idea, this is called clinical equipoise. And in the ISAT trial, only 20% of the patients had clinical equipoise. And in, in those patients, you should embolize them. That's the message. So embolize the embolizables, uh, embolize those with, with clinical equipoise, and then those that are easily clippable should be clipped. So there is no argument for stenting or for whatever procedures in ruptured aneurysms. The last thing, and this is even more important, is uh, this, 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 this study here. Um, and the, the ISAT trial was an intent to treat um, statistic. It means you were randomized for surgery or for embolization and you re remained in this group forever. In the ISAT trial, as you can see, uh, a significant portion um, of, of, of aneurysms rebled prior to surgery. It, some of them died, but they were counted as surgical mortality. They never saw the surgeon. They, they, they died in the hospital before the surgeon came. But the ISAT trial calculated them as surgical mortality. When you eliminate those patients, the whole ISAT trial becomes insignificant. That's of major importance. That means um, uh, there is no trial indicating that surgery is better for ruptured aneurysms. But of course, if you, if you do those modifications, if, if, if you use an post hoc as treated algorithm for statistics, it loses significance. Again, there are many advantages. Look at endovascular treatment. You are completely independent of, of vasospasm. So you can dilate your way to the aneurysm. Once you have a, once you've established your way, you can embolize it on day five, on day seven, you don't have to care. There are new devices. And when we, when we usually see those devices, we, we get some, some sometimes some allergic reactions. Yeah? But of course, imagine, Imagine you have a broad-based, um, ruptured, um, large, posteriorly pointing basilar apex aneurysm. Um, uh, how to treat? Um, uh, stent and coil, flow divert. Yeah. You, you always have intraluminal devices and they need double antifilted medication. It would be fantastic to have something like, like a device that can bridge broad necks, but be in the aneurysm and not inside the artery, an intra-aneurysmal an intra flow diverter. But this is the web device. And of course, you don't need this aggressive um, double antipletal medication. So this is the ideal treatment, of course. Of course, web devices have no, in my understanding, no place in MCA aneurysms, in ACOM aneurysms, and so forth. They are um, uh, implants that, that, that lend themselves some um, uh, for, for the treatment um, of, of difficult, otherwise not manageable aneurysms. Coiling and then the giant aneurysms, as you know, this is a very old paper, 20 years old, but it still is true. When you have partially thrombosed large and giant aneurysms and, and, and you coil them, you can carry on coiling them forever and forever because they will recur forever and forever. That means um, uh, endocircular coiling is, is, is no treatment on, uh, for giant aneurysms. Final remark to the coiling, when your treatment algorithm includes coil removal for clipping, you should know uh, when the coiling was done. When you have an acute complication like here, when you occlude the pericolosal piece because your coils were placed in, in the wrong place, you can rush to the OR and take out the coils. And I show this case only to show you how easily you can get out the coils because it's just done one and a half hours before. A complete different story when the coils have been implanted the months before and your clipping strategy re relies on coil removal because those coils are scarred into the aneurysm and, the, and you will never get them out like this. These are very traumatic procedures and then probably, uh, if, if you have a good chance, probably stent them or do whatever, but, but, but don't try to remove the coils. Coming to stenting. Um, uh, uh, stenting is more or less something uh, like using a, a neck bridging device. 
The common stent is a non-occlusive device. That means placing a stent does not occlude the aneurysm because we don't use covered stents. But the stent uh, can serve as, a, as an interface um, uh, that allows coiling of broad-based aneurysms. So stenting and coiling has a reconstructive capacity similar to aneurysm clipping, as you can see here. The stent is incorporated into the artery wall and by doing so, you can taper the, the antipleted medication after some months. And of course, there are many cases where you're very happy that this technique is around and you would not like to, to clip this aneurysm, but you're very happy that you can stent and coil it. And then suddenly everything it is easy. Again, um, uh, coiling posterior circulation aneurysms with stent support is reasonable. On the right hand side, you see an MCA aneurysm that has a Y stenting and then you place the coils inside and then, then you don't need surgery. Yeah? Again, in my understanding, um, uh, straightforward um, MCA aneurysm surgery in expert hands has a morbidity way lower than the morbidity of, of, of a stent assisted um, coiling, as you can see here. So morbidity and mortality of, of, of stenting and of stent assist is not zero. And, and the first number, 7.4% is a very old number, so probably we should no longer argue with this, but there is still a significant morbidity and mortality, way higher than coiling. That means um, the ISA trial results, well, nowadays we stand and coil the ruptured aneurysms went, of course, but you had significant additional procedural morbidity and mortality. When you compare uh, the, the ordinary stent with a flow diverter that you see below, you see, that the, the pore size is of course larger with, with the ordinary stent, but the, the, the amount of metal that you use is the same, but the pore size differs. And how does a flow diverter work? Well, um, imagine an ordinary stent, the occlusion rate is zero. Imagine a covered stent, well, the occlusion rate is 100% at the cost of the perforators. When you have something in between like a flow diverter, it means you have a pore size that is so small that a blind sac behind the aneurysm, um, behind the flow diverter, will thrombose like an aneurysm. On the other hand, um, uh, something like an artery with its sump effect um, uh, will um, uh, render this flow diverting device open. And this is the, the critical point. A flow diverter occludes um, uh, the aneurysm, so the blind sac, but the flow diverter does not occlude uh, the branches, so it does not include the perforators. And by doing so, um, uh, it becomes uh, almost easy um, to, to manage the most complicated aneurysms just by placing a stent. And there is a, a, a downside. And the downside is um, that when you place a flow diverter alone, you have the, the following cascade of, of, of events. First, um, uh, there is no more uh, contrast influx into the aneurysm. Okay. But the pressure in the aneurysm remains the same. That means the flow diverter is not a pressure diverter. You have the patient under double pleated, anti pleated medication and you have flow diverter, but the pressure inside the aneurysm is still the same. So it, it, it's not the treatment for, for ruptured aneurysms and it's not the treatment for bliss aneurysms. Um, uh, when you don't place coils into the aneurysm beforehand, what happens is that slowly thrombus occurs. But this thrombus is not a static benign structure, but it is um, uh, enzymatically active and it can digest itself through the aneurysm wall because the aneurysm wall undergoes atrophy for uh, as soon as there is an occlusion like coiling or stenting. Now what happened in, 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 in the first cases was you used the flow diverter but no coils inside and uh, the pressure was the same. The patient was under double antipleted medication. The thrombus got active, the, the wall underwent atrophy and the aneurysm ruptured. What you do nowadays, of course, is that you coin the aneurysm beforehand and then you place the flow diverter. So you, you had um, catastrophic hemorrhages in, double, in patients under double antipleted medication that were usually fatal. Flow diverters, of course, are fantastic oh. tools um, when you have the proper patients, as you can see here. There's only one vertebral artery, there's a dissection, a severe stenosis, um, and you just flow divert the patient. And um, uh, like, like voodoo, so to say, um, uh, with, with, the, with the intrinsic radial force of the flow diverter, after three months, um, the section is covered, it's, it has remodeled, um, and then, then the stenosis also has been, has been treated. So flow diversion makes perfect sense. But again, the morbidity is even higher than with, uh, than with conventional stents. So the, the, the fantasy of the industry that almost every aneurysm in the future should be flow diverted, of course, 
well, there is a significant mortality rate. I, I, I don't see the point to, to float a word five millimeter ophthalmic artery aneurysms with a mortality rate of 2%. No way. That means um, uh, flow diversion has its, has its role, but it, it is not the future. A, a, a 10,000 euro device with, with a 2% mortality is not the future. Okay. Yeah. And of course, a flow diverter is not a pressure diverter as I indicated before. Final remark to the, to the stenting is the following. When you implant the stent, you change the wall properties. That means when you, for example, stent and coil, the ophthalmic artery aneurysm, and then you want to go and clip an MCA aneurysm, and you need proximal control. It is questionable whether or not you can get proximal control in a previously stented artery. Look at this. Um, you can use different um, temporary clips, as you can see here, and we, we, we built a machine like this one that can build up tremendous closing forces. Um, and when you look at this machine um, and you place it in, in, in a rabbit model and you implant different stents, like an enterprise stent or like, like a neuroform stent, you see that uh, the initial closing force was this. When you have an enterprise stent in place, the, the, the closing force doubles and with a neuroform stent, it, 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 it is almost 10 times closing force. That means when you use conventional temporary clips, like in this case, when you use the enterprise stent, you can you can occlude the artery. But when you use a, a neuroform stent and you use conventional temporary clips, you have a good chance that you cannot get proximal control in, in this stented artery. So stenting gum aneurysms um, and stenting proximal uh, arteries that are used for proximal control in aneurysm surgery uh, can pose a significant problem because then you do aneurysm surgery without proximal control or you use large definitive clips to to get proximal control but then of course you will kink the stent and have a completely different problems final remark to to neck bridging devices and if you don't want stents and if you don't want flow diverters in the acute phase what you can do is balloon remodeling is we use um, a balloon you inflate it across the aneurysm orifice coil the aneurysm and then deflate the balloon and um, what, uh, I couldn't believe it many years before, but, but it works. Um, the, the coils don't jump out of the aneurysm because they are more, more or less uh, broken and luxated into the aneurysm. And when you deflate the, uh, the balloon, they stay there and they don't jump. Out. So this is a, a good alternative for broad-based aneurysms uh, where stenting is, is not feasible, for example, in ruptured aneurysms. Now let's come to the so-called deconstructive procedures. Well, Deconstructive procedures um, I mean that you occlude the parent artery together with the aneurysm. Well, this is uh, usually not a good strategy in the brain, as you know, and it only works when you have sufficient collaterals. And you can test those collaterals like, like using balloon test occlusion. And when you do so, of course, it, it has it, its advantages. The aneurysm can shrink significantly. You can resolve from uh, compressive neuropathy in the cavernous sinus and so forth. Yeah? So, of course, it makes perfect sense. But in the vast majority of cases, I mean, you will not get away with it. So what you need is bypass surgery. And there are many, many diff different scenarios of bypass surgery, and I want to show you some. You can have in the anterior circulation all kinds of bypasses. Yeah? Um, the, the, the term low flow bypass is wrong. I just put it here to be provocative, but low flow, what is that? I, I will try to show you. In the posterior circulation, you can do low flow bypass surgery, and there are some, some donor grafts you can use, and then some are easier to use than others, and I, will, I can only show you how I do it. And in the anterior circulation, of course, you can do any any form of, of high flow conduits if there are no STAs or if you feel that you have to do it. I take my first sneezing breath, sorry. And back we go. So talking about anterior circulation, low flow bypass surgery, you always think about um, the STA because this is the classic low flow donor a graft. But of course, the STA, when you have an STA double pedicle a construct, this is not necessarily low flow. Um, Spexler mentioned this some um, 20 years ago. And then, then the, uh, in, in Vienna, they, they did a, I did a lot of cases, um, and they, they were not low flow. So as you can see, in this case, on the left-hand side, I'm a partially coiled, ruptured paracolloidal aneurysm. And you see the, the carotid artery filling in an autograde fashion. On the right side, you see now the carotid artery and the aneurysm coiled. And what you see is, is, is the hemisphere now hooked to two so-called low flow bypasses. Now, of course, 
um, this is not low flow and it can take care of the entire hemisphere. The point that I want to make it probably right now is the following. For as long as you can test occlude the awake patient, you can use STA bypasses. That means in, the, in these cases, I'm, uh, I used to have the following strategy to do a double pedicle STA MCA bypass, then wait for two days and then to test the patient, the awake patient. Um, why wait for two days? Well, two days are usually long enough that the patient recovers from surgery. Two days are long enough that you can use full ant uh, anticoagulation for test occlusion. And still, um, two days are short enough so that the bypass some, uh, doesn't occlude, never occlude. And then you can test occlude the, the awake patient. <clears throat> and when he angiographically and clinically passes the test occlusion, then you can do the final occlusion using coilings or endovascular. And so you can more or less undersize your bypass. When you, when you are obliged to do the, the artery occlusion in the, in the patient under general anesthesia in the, in the same session, like doing the bypass surgery, so when you have no endovascular strategy, then you should oversize the bypass. So you, then you have a large bypass, a vein or a radial artery. This is usually too much, um, but you never know beforehand. So better to have a bypass that is too large um, than to have a patient that is awaking and stroking. So whenever you can check it in the awake patient, uh, STA might be, STA double pedicle might be enough. Uh, STA might also be enough when you also want to replace a certain territory and not the entire hemisphere. If you can't do so, you need to wait. This image just shows you that um, uh, when there are lesions that look like uh, they cannot be reconstructed and you need a bypass, it's often worthwhile to explore the lesion. And often you see that uh, this aneurysm, of course, like in this case, you see that this branch is not coming off the aneurysm fundus, but it's coming off the aneurysm um, uh, base. And it was just a rendering artifact from, uh, from, from the 3D angiography. And you don't need a bypass and you can, you can click it as you can see it here very easily. So you don't need a bypass. Uh, you can also bring those, uh, those SDA double pedicles deeper into the sylvian fissures. And no one says that you have to hook the, the SDA bypass to the cortex, like, like cases like this. So you have um, um, uh, remnants um, from, from previously treated aneurysms. Uh, you don't go to the cortex, but you open the sylvian fissure. Um, and then you go to the, to the M2 branches, and then you bring your two strong donor graft into the sylvian fissure, do the yet to do the anastomosis. And then you have something that is again, let's say not a low flow bypass, so to speak. This case I like the most, just, just to, to make my point, um, this is a serpentine aneurysm, so partially thrombosed, the ruptured larger aneurysm. Um, uh, the plan was um, uh, to do um, a, a double pedicle um, uh, STA MCA bypass and then to, to do distal occlusion. We found no way to do proximal occlusion, who are afraid of the perforating branches. So we said, okay, Vagelich and Sato, they, 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 they always re report that their experience with, with this occlusion, let's try it. Um, interestingly, when, when the bypass was in place, as you can see, the, this, this double pedicle, so-called low flow bypass was stronger than the internal carotid artery. So there was complete flow reversal. And now the aneurysm was, was filling from, from the periphery, as you can see here. That means the, the so-called distal occlusion became approximate. That means a low flow bypass um, uh, uh, is probably a, a wrong term, but, but you can say it's, 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 it's an STMC bypass. And if the, the indication is, is, is correct, if the donor graft has a reasonable size, um, uh, and if it's technically correct, then uh, you, you can have a remarkable revascularization also with those small pedicles. The same holds true for the posterior circulation. Um, I, I like this case because it, it shows the, the difficulties, but also the advantages. Rupture, is, excuse the, the German words here. Um, uh, ruptured um, proximal pica dissection. What you can do is some um, you can coil it. Yeah? To coil it means to risk a, a pica infarction, but not only in the hemisphere, but also a perforate infarction because the, the brainstem perforators are also coming off proximal pica, as you know, as you can see also on, on the right hand side. So you have the, the dissection, but you also have the brainstem perforators. When you look um, at this at this operation video, uh, you see the dissection site and, and you see the brainstem perforators. So the strategy is, is, is to, to clip the uh, uh, pica takeoff, then to do the 
bypassing in, in the ordinary fashion. So this is the, the pica loop, and then you bring down the occipital artery as a donor graft, you do your bypass, then you open the bypass, and then you look what happens. And now you can go, go ahead and, and trap the dissection, and here the brainstem perforators are preserved, which would not be preserved, of course, when you coil it. Um, and now um, pica, proximal, and distal is hooked to your bypass. And when you open the bypass under ICG, as you can see, it fills backward. And by filling backward, it also fills the brainstem perforators. So this is some, uh, of course, way more invasive than just coiling it. But, but, but uh, you, you, the patient has no brainstem stroke and has no hemispheric stroke. That means that in the end, you occlude pica. You have a, a bypass that is now filling pica. Uh, and then you see also in, in, in the CTA, appropriate bypass function. And that means also, of course, when you don't do it like this, when you coil occlude or when you bypass is, 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 is probably a suboptimal. The first thing is if you don't respect the brainstem perforators and, and, and you, need, you include it into your clipping or your coiling, you have the brainstem stroke. And if your bypass doesn't work or when you just occlude pica like, like nothing, there's a good chance that you have the hemispheric infarction too. There, there, there is no guarantee that you, that you have um, Ica, pica, or, or, or vermian anastomosis. Um, uh, this, the, you cannot predict, and probably it's better to be on the safe side. Finally, talking about pica, of course, what you can do, um, I, in, I'll say in, in ruptured cases, is to do in, in situ anastomosis. Um, this is a ruptured case, so please ex excuse the, the blood in the operative field, but it, it makes sense. So when, when the two pikas are more or less kissing, it, 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 it's, it's a good idea to do a side-to-side -side anastomosis. Um, uh, that means, um, I, what, what is the, the advantage? Well, you don't need to suture a, a, a bypass. So you, you don't need to, to dissect the occipital artery, but it's usually a pain. What is the, the downside? Well, the downside is if this does not work, you lose both pikas, like in every in-situ bypass. To check whether or not the bypass is, is functioning, you can test to glute one, one uh, uh, artery and under ICG, you see now when you take away the clip, then you see how, how the flow is, is crossing the sides and then you know that the bypass is open. So that's an alternative. But of course, uh, you can use the, the occipital artery for any location in the posterior circulation. Um, uh, uh, for the PCA, um, instead of um, subtemporal bypasses, you can use some, uh, the occipital artery with some precautions. The problem with the occipital artery, um, uh, using it um, uh, as a donor artery for the PCA on the occipital lobe is that there is a significant caliber mismatch between the occipital artery and, and the distal PCA. And usually the large occipital artery torques and kinks on the, uh, the PCA and then the bypass occludes. Um, what, for, for, for my personally, what, what I found useful is to try to suture this bypass interhemispherically. That means the patient is not in prone position, but in the lateral position. You have a lumbar drain. You use gravity ret uh, retraction, and then the dependent hemisphere falls down, and you can get it interhemispherically, as you can see here. And then you look as deep as you can manage it um, manually um, for, a, for a PCA branch that, that has a reasonable caliber. And then you can do an oblique to side um, anastomosis um, uh, from the occipital artery um, uh, to, to the PCA, and then you have a, a functioning bypass, as you can see here. That means um, you have um, uh, the occipital artery as a as donor graft, but this donor graft um, is sufficient to retrogradely fill the parietal occipital artery and then autogradely fill the occipital and the calcroin artery. And then again, you go ahead and, and, and coil the aneurysms. You, you don't even have to care about the aneurysm uh, on, on, on P2, but you can just um, coil it once you have done your bypass. Anterior circulation high flow. Well, you know hagen poiseuille's equation, and you know that nothing beats the radius. So when you double the radius, you have 16 times the flow. So that's an argument, of course, and that makes it worthwhile to try high flow bypasses. That means um, uh, you have <clears throat> in, the, in those surgeries you have four surgical fields. You have the, the craniotomy site, you have the uh, the, the carotid proximal anastomosis, site, and you have um, uh, the femoral site. And you have the you have to carve the vein, such a vein that something like 40 centimeters, but it's quite a lot. But in, in the end, um, uh, your, your surgical field um, uh, uh, looks like this, and this is the result. And you can have, as, as you can see, um, bypasses of, of reasonable caliber, so to speak, and you can replace an entire carotid artery just by proximal artery occlusion and placing such a bypass. 
in the end, it looks like this. Some, uh, it is debatable whether or not um, the, the incision that, that the neck should be so large. I feel more comfortable, but of course, there, there, there is ample, ample space to improve. I know. Anyway, um, uh, it does not make sense to go to M1 or even to the, to, to, to the, to the uh, C1, M1, but it's way enough to go to M2, in my understanding. That means um, uh, the, the problem with those bypasses is the following. The deeper you go, the more complicated is the surgery. The deeper you go, the larger is the incision. The larger your donor graft, the deeper you have to go because you don't want the caliber mismatch. The deeper you go when you're cross clamping, the larger is the territory that you render is scenic during suturing. So the, the, the more complicated the procedure, the faster you have to suture and the higher the stroke risk, of course, even with, with, with barbiturate. That means this is a complicated procedure. And when you only have an, an M2 branch that you cross clamp instead of M1, of course, it's only half the territory. So of, of, of course it's a, it's a bargain. So you, you have your proximal anastomosis, you have, you have your two M2 branches, you cross, you, you cross clamp, you use a corneal scalpel. This is the, the most accurate scalpel that you can find. You do your arteriotomy, you have again your anastomosis, and then you, you have established your treatment. If you don't uh, tell, um, I can show you that you can do it even on the surface. Um, I know this, this vein is looking ugly, but of course, on the cortex, um, it takes care of an entire hemisphere. Yeah? So the carotid occlusion, no cross flow, the entire hemisphere is this hook to this bypass. This has been published years ago, as you can see, very old paper. And usually you should not do it, of course, because you should not risk a calibre mismatch. But if you are left with the option to do nothing, you can even try the vein on the cortex. Just to, just to give you this impression. When you do this procedure, you can either use some um, uh, your, your saphenous vein in an end to side procedure uh, on the external carotid artery at the neck, for example, at, 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 the, at the inferior um, thyroid artery, or you, you can do it end to end, then you simply cut through the external carotid artery and establish an end to end conduit. And once you have done so, then, then you have your your vein here, then you have to tunnel it behind the ear. I do it behind the ear. You can do it in front, of course, and all fancy things, I do it behind the ear. And then you come back and, and, and then you have to do your proximal anastomosis. And again, as you can see, now this is an M1 anastomosis, just, just to show you for, 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 for the sake of discussion. Again, you, you have here your, your vein that has already been tunneled. The vein comes uh, deep to M1. You cross clamp, uh, you need to include all the branches, of course, it means M1 proximal, M1 distal, and this temporal polar artery, as you can see here, and also this branch, this branch was not a perforator. And then you, you do your arteriotomy and then you start, to start your suturing. And of course you suture the way that you feel most comfortable. Running sutures are faster, um, uh, interrupted sutures are more accurate. Uh, when you mix the two techniques, you may, you, you may run into the complication that when you do one side running and one side interrupted, and then you open, then the, the back side that is usually running might get loose because your interrupted sutures have a different tension that you run, and then, then you're, you're running suture at the back. But usually um, uh, under, under monitoring, and you all do this under monitoring and then, then the, under, under, under barbiturates and under protection, then you, uh, you get away with this in, in 25 to 30 minutes, and, uh, and then you reopen, and then they have established your conduit as you can see here, and as I showed you beforehand, of course, it means proximal anastomosis, as you can see here, distal anastomosis, as you, as you can see here, and it's filling the entire hemisphere. Of course, this is the, the sense of a, of a large bypass. And for the skip this, um, talking about um, uh, posterior circulation, when there are no posterior circulation high flow bypasses, and even in expert hands, some um, uh, at the Mayo Clinic, um, this, this, this quotation, I think, is, 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 is um, Pathognomonic, so to say, major undertaking should not be performed lightheartedly. And as you know, the results are very disappointing. And this is, of course, the, uh, the, 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 the moment where, where flow diversion or whatever technique steps in, and you should not, um, you should not bypass high flow bypass in the posterior circulation. Finally, so called flow modification techniques. Well, as you can see, you can modify the flow in a way. Um, uh, that you can reverse the flow, for example, and by doing so, you can occlude arteries without um, uh, using bypasses. Large um, uh, P, uh, P1, P2 aneurysm, um, uh, balloon test occluded, no deficit, um, uh, 
coil embolized. And as you can see in this angiogram, this is now a carotid angiogram and via leptomeningeal anastomosis uh, uh, from the cortex, uh, the, the, the PCA is filling in a retrograde fashion uh, without a bypass simply because this leptomeningeal anastomosis were active. You have to test for this and then only well when you find this angiographic pattern and when the patient re remains intact, you can occlude and then you can do your flow modification. You can go, you can bring this even further. Bilateral um, uh, ruptured um, uh, sort of bleeding um, um, uh, vertebral artery dissections, what to do when one could discuss nowadays some stenting or whatever, by then this was not available. What you can do is in the awake patient, you can test and you can include one vertebral artery after the other, of course, only when you test. Um, uh, the bottom line, I think this was called the so-called vascular vacuum theory by Moray. That means um, uh, when you occlude proximal to pica, then the pica territory, due to its metabolic demand, uh, uh, creates such a sump and such a suction effect that you can drag blood um, via the, 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 the PCOMs into the basilar artery, and then you can reverse the flow in the basilar trunk. Well, of course, this is a one in a million procedure, but of course, when you have appropriate PCOMs, then you can re revert the flow. Also, the, the, the procedures described by Steinberg, but deliberate basilar artery occlusion work like this. So when you occlude on, 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 under controlled conditions um, and you have appropriate PCOMs and you have appropriate monitoring, um, you can get away with it. But of course, um, this is why this is very much at the end of the of, of this talk, um, that this is, I would even call it a experimental and probably not, not even feasible nowadays. Um, finally, um, uh, there are procedures um, um, that are called um, endovascular tunicase or endovascular throttle techniques. Like the tunicase um, from, from Drake, you can um, partially um, coil an aneurysm and heparinize the patient for one week. And when you have the patient heparinized for one week, this, this aneurysm will occlude very, very um, in, in a very um, retarded way. And during this way or uh, during this period of retarded occlusion, the collaterals can mature. And then uh, at, the, at the same pace that the collaterals um, are mature, the aneurysm will occlude and you can occlude this without stroking the patient. So these are flow modification techniques. Also, of course, some deconstructive procedures, um, but, but, but they should be wisely chosen because the, the morbidity is even higher. At the very end, my, my, my last two slides, um, when we talk about um, multimodality, well, when you have a team of, of surgeons and, and radiologists doing it together and they are good friends, perfect. Like in Milan, for example, no? surgeons up and then Dodi Bocardi, excellent. Um, uh, when you're a, a hybrid guy and you do both yourself, I think it, it doesn't make sense that you do easy surgery today and then and, and, and do easy coiling tomorrow because that, that's not the point of, of hybrid. Hybrid um, has the intention to create procedures that are not possible otherwise. So you, you need to blend um, the two techniques um, uh, to, to come to therapeutic strategies that one alone could never accomplish. This also is the, uh, the, the rationale for using hybrid ORs. In this case, for example, you, you have this, um, this, this um, BB junction aneurysm, and there is no way of approaching the aneurysm from a, a, by an endovascular route. So what is being done is that, that you, in this case, um, um, use a, a surgical approach to, to, to the vertebral artery C, uh, at C1 um, at, at the atlas. You puncture the artery and by doing so, you, you bring the microcatheter in, into the vertebral artery. A uh, second catheter is in the proximal vertebral artery on the other side. So you, in, in prone position, you can do diagnostic angiography from the left vertebral artery and you can do coiling via the right vertebral artery. And once the aneurysm has been coiled, you take it out, suture the vertebral artery, and uh, as you can see here, both words are still patent, um, and and um, uh, the aneurysm has been occluded. Now, um, uh, you know, the video doesn't work, so I'm deeply sorry, but uh, I think this this chart shows you what, what I wanted to show you. Bottom line is some, uh, as a surgeon alone, without endovascular expertise, you cannot do it. If you invite your radiologist to want to puncture the vertebral artery uh, intraoperatively for me at C1, he will ask you, well, what's up? So probably if, if, if you create the procedure, you do it on your own, you know what you want to do. You can create procedures that, that have a certain beauty because they're only possible because you, you are a 
uh, mastering both techniques, so to speak, the, the best of two worlds. So um, uh, that's it from, from my side. This, this was some, uh, what, I could, what I could contribute to, to this mod, multi, multimodality management in the hands of, of a neurosurgeon. Could also be uh, the perfect um, neurovascular team with surgeon and radiologist. In, in, in my case, some of the cases I, I showed you were, were by, by hybrid guy. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, uh, very nice and interesting talk on the management of aneurysms. Um, so there are a few questions from the audience um, and I hope a few other questions will come in soon. Um, the first question is, how would you treat a salum basilar perforator aneurysm with SAH, flow diverter, yes or no? Yes, I would. Um, uh... Yes, I would. Um, uh, it, it's evident that, that the flow diverters some um, have their FDA mark only for the anterior circulation and then only for, for the for the intracavernous and probably for, for the ophthalmics. And um, uh, of course, flow diverters have, have the problem that this device has been marketed prematurely um, and the company itself um, um, has no idea how it works. And when, when you ask the company people, um, uh, they say, well, don't use it in the posterior circulation because there are the perforators. Yeah? Um, so tell me what, what how do you call the arteries at A1 and M1? And so so, so the, 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 the idea of where to use and where not to use them is, 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 is not, is, is, does not come from experts. Yeah? But of course, some um, further version of the posterior circulation, um, when you have nothing else available, is a, is, a, is, a, is a very appropriate solution. It's always a question of what is the inherent morbidity of, of your procedure? What is the, 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 the morbidity of the natural course of the disease and what is the morbidity of the alternative procedures? So flow diverting um, small ophthalmic artery aneurysms probably makes no sense. You know? Flow diverting um, ruptured um, uh, basilar trunk or apex aneurysms so that, that don't lend themselves to clipping, coiling, whatever, makes perfect sense. Yes, thank you. What, what we, are, we are now confronted more and more, or at least I am, with um, the, the new wave of flow diverters, which are the mini flow diverters. Do you have any opinion about them? Are they truly different from the, let's say, normal flow diverters, or are they only another name for <laughs> the same problem? Well, um, uh, they are basically the, the same, of course. Um, uh, but of course, you know, um, uh, the initial or the, the original flow diverters were, were built for a certain uh, artery caliber. This, of course, limits them uh, to, to proximal aneurysms at, 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 at larger arteries. And if you want to go further distally, you need those, those mini flow diverting devices. Because when, when you use the, the, the large flow diverters some, uh, in, in small arteries, um, you would occlude the artery. Um, uh, of course, um, you could use it, for example, for um, uh, fusiform peripheral aneurysms, for example. No? So there are many good indications. Um, uh, and they are not feasible for, for, for flow diverting uh, pica aneurysms, for example. It's complete rubbish. Um, uh, but of course, that there, there will be good indications. Um, uh, industry will try to aggressively market it for every aneurysm again. And we will have to, to, to look at the data and then they will reject this, this, this offer again. Yeah, there's a question. Um... I just read it. You mentioned that in ruptured cases, those aneurysms which are easily clippable should go for clipping rather than endovascular therapy. Which ruptured aneurysm would fall into that category, in your opinion? Well, um, in the anterior circulation, um, that means when an aneurysm is broad based, um, a small MCA bifurcation aneurysm ruptured. Yeah. So this is the, uh, this this is um, nothing for 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 bare platinum coil embolization. Um, uh, so ISAT does not say that you should at, at any cost try to suboptimally um, coil occlude this aneurysm, broad-based ruptured MCA, because uh, it's ruptured. No, you should clip it. And ISAT, because there the, the were no stands around, does not say that you should stand and coil a small um, uh, ruptured MCA aneurysm. So whenever um, the surgical uh, treatment is straightforward and the endovascular treatment um, uh, is something like, um, uh, let's try, um, well, I, I don't feel good about it, but ISAT tells me to do so, that's wrong. You know, when, when, it's, when it's good surgery and complicated embolization, it should be clipped, of course. Okay, is it a question from the uh, 
same person. Um, it is widely accepted now that most posterior circulation animals are usually managed best with endovascular therapy. Are there any exceptions to this rule in your opinion? Um, exceptions are getting rare, yeah. But of course, some if you have, for example, access problems, some uh, if, if you don't get your catheter up, um, um, if for, for one reason or another, um, uh, you cannot anticoagulate the patient, uh, blah blah blah. So these things, um, uh, recurrences, some of, of previously coiled um, uh, aneurysms, yeah. Um, you know the Brad results. Some um, that means um, in, in the pica territory when it's ruptured, um, it, it's, it's a good choice to 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 coil it. Basilar apex goes without saying. Um, so in in very rare cases, you can advocate it. The problems, of course, some um, uh, if you say, well, in the rare case, I do it. Yeah, then you then you should know how to do it. So so when it's when you cannot embolize it, you should not try basilar arch aneurysm surgery, of course. Well, what's your personal opinion about the uh, VA pica aneurysms because um, I often have no no that's not so 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 frequent but sometimes I have the discussion with our new radiologists about uh, the patency of the uh, pica itself uh, which can be hampered by the coils and um, in my opinion clipping a pica aneurysm if it's not too big is is not so difficult uh, what's your opinion? What's your opinion about uh, these special type of aneurysms? Exactly, because pica usually does not take off the, the VA, but it takes off the, the, the aneurysm itself. So it's more or less a, uh, it, it comes from the aneurysm neck. That means when you coil the pica aneurysm completely, then then you have to occlude pica. Um, this is why you use some uh, fenestrated clips so often with, with with pica aneurysm clipping. I think um, for surgery, when when you don't come from from let's say from a prone position between the, the lower cranial nerves, but when you come from lateral and more or less in a, a tangential fashion, following uh, the, the VA, then you will not hurt those nerves and you can you you can safely clip it. And, uh, never would we, we would sacrifice pica uh, because the existence of of, of an anastomosis is highly unpredictable. You cannot test to clue it. You cannot balloon occlude a pica and look what, what's going to happen. Uh, but but you have to. You have to hope, and then hope is, is, is my, my understanding, and no, no, no valid strategy in neurosurgery. There's a, another question uh, from an Austrian neurosurgeon. Do you think uh, there exists something like a hybrid neurosurgeon who can master both techniques on the same high level, um, especially with anovascular techniques and devices rapidly evolving? And that's that's always the, the question that, that that you have to be very honest to yourself when you answer. Um, I personally think um, that the time that you devote to learn um, uh, ventral dorsal stabilization or or, or um, uh, stereotactic neurosurgery or whatever yeah, is at least as much as as, as 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 you need to devote to learn endovascular procedures. Uh, and then you still are treating the the same disease using different um, uh, devices, different um, uh, uh, tools. Uh, but 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 uh, your knowledge about the disease still stays the same. Uh, I, the, the point is true that that um, endovascular tools are are uh, rapidly evolving, and then every month there there's a new something, and it becomes very difficult uh, to to keep track with, with all those innovations. But that's perfectly true. Um, but but I I simply don't agree that you can only do one on on a, on a high level. As in a question from Radik Fritsch. Um, he uh, saying that it was a nice lecture, and um, he asked, um, he asked, do you really consider flow that were unsuitable for blister aneurysms, even as a rescue solution? Yes, um, uh, uh, this is uh, again a, a good point that I, that I can that we can discuss longer. But of course, um, when you say a, a flow diverter is not a pressure diverter, um, then it should be inappropriate. Uh, I completely accept that there are now so many uh, case series where they treat it with, with flow diversion and, and then they treat it perfectly and always wait for, 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 for the ruptures and they don't occur. So um, uh, the, the, the more cases are being published and then that are, are, are being presented at, at meetings and the large case series that, that, that are managed brilliantly, 
um, uh, you you have to ask yourself whether or not um, uh, clip wrapping is is can can compete with it. Usually not. Yeah. So I think that, that the strategy is is in, in a process of, of being defined, and is probably now changing towards towards flow diversion. Yeah, that's true. There's a question in the in the chat, um, and um, he asks about the percentages of procedures you are doing either endovascularly or surgically in your department last year or that year. So rough estimate. It should be 50-50. That means um, uh, you have um, um, more um, ruptured cases because we have a, a large catchment area. On the other side, we, we have a certain um, bias because we have a certain referral a base that probably provide us with, with with more complicated cases so so this this more or less gives this this trade-off yeah i do you think that's a question for me that um you should look at um, a certain percentage for microsurgery just to 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 stay in training if um, you're giving too many aner aneurysms to the anovascular guys so that you're losing these um aneurysms for training or for your own experience? I think it depends on, 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 on the team spirit, more to say. Yeah? Usually you, you can make deals. Yeah? So um, if, 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 if he wants um, so badly uh, web devices for the next Congress to show the pictures, uh, and you want so badly aneurysms to, to teach your young residents. Yeah? So I think it's a, when, when you get along neatly, then, 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 then there's always a way. Um, I also have a question. Have you any experience about um, clipping um, aneurysms which have been pre-treated with web devices and uh, uh, which uh, has had grown remnants? So I operated now two. Uh, do we have any experience or do you know how it's, if it's an um, easy task for me, it seems as it's treating like a cold aneurysm, but um, I would like to know if someone or you have different experiences i have not done but but it should be like a coiled aneurysm probably even easier because there's not so much material inside the aneurysm uh, i see another question from dan walsh uh, the performance which is occlusion and safety between different intracellular flow disruptors seem to vary a lot between devices have you any insights into why this is or advice on how they should be integrated into your practice? Well, I know the, the numbers for the web device, and this is why I, I introduced the web device in this way, because of course, it's a, the numbers are not bad, I think. Um, uh, of course, uh, there are a couple of papers describing that the, the morbidity of, of web devices in the MCA is way higher uh, than with, with uh, clipping in, in, in expert hands. I, I have no idea why other devices like Luna and so forth, why they don't perform this way. Um, um, but I think it's, if you ask me, I'm, I'm speculating. Yeah? Um, there are a couple of flow diverters um, that perform completely differently. Uh, so you had the, 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 uh, the, the, the pipeline that was um, perfect. Then you had the, the surplus device that was usually at the beginning, not so, not so easy. And then, then you had the others Elvis. Yeah? So there, there are small differences in, 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 in the construction of, of the device seem to make major differences in, in long-term stability, but also in, in, in procedural complication rates. But this is my, my personal opinion. I personally fear a bit that the web devices um, will be used more often in the future, especially uh, in the MCA aneurysm. You showed um, the example of the um, basal tip aneurysm, which was treated by web device or with a web device. But if you're looking into the angular architecture of an MCA aneurysm and a basal tip aneurysm, it looks more or less similar. So um, I'm not quite sure if uh, this could be in the future problematic for the newer searching. Well, probably, um, I think that the consequences um, uh, of, of, of complication are different. I mean, um, when you look at the MCA, um, uh, it, it is, it, it is. I think one can say that the, it is a safe procedure. Yeah? Uh, and again, um, uh, the 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 endo, the intra the intra aneurysmal flow breaker um, um, has certain um, um, mobilities that you cannot predict, like like um, recurrence, perforation. Um, uh, 
thromboembolism and so forth. Yeah? But, uh, but uh, at the basilar tip, of course, um, uh, with the same complication profile of, of, of the web device, your surgery has a different complication profile. So of course, um, the, it, it, it weighs towards um, uh, <coughs> the web device, uh, the basilar apex, but of course it, it weighs towards surgery at the DMCA bifurcation. <coughs> Um, another question from me. So you gave the um, results or you showed some papers uh, about the stent results, but um, I sometimes ask myself if they are not biased towards more negative results because uh, it was uh, a case selection of more difficult cases. What do you think about this? Um, that's true. And there are even um, high quality papers saying that there is no difference. But um, uh, at least there is there is no paper saying that uh, the morbidity is lower with the stent. Yeah? So of course, you have an additional device and this device um, uh, is inside the artery and it's uh, prone to thrombosis uh, and then, then, then uh, stent occlusion and, and emboli. So um, it, it, it cannot be the same. Yeah? Um, and, and, and you need, you need an anticoagulation. So, um, it must be higher, but of course, it's not so dramatically higher, but it, it, at least it, it should be appreciated when you do your risk assessment between different treatment strategies. There are two <laughs> questions um, asking about the line between conservative management and active intervention according to size of aneurysm, which size should not be operated if not ruptured? Well, um, uh, we have... Um, uh, the Isuya results, but we also have um, we have uh, scores to try to help us. I, I don't have to explain faces and then unwrapped the score, but of course um, uh, it makes perfect sense um, uh, that that um, certain small aneurysms uh, might be more rupture prone than others. Let's say um, PCOMs, posterior circulation, or also ACOM. Um, you have smokers, you have hypertensive people, and so forth. That means some um, uh, uh, size. Some um, is, I think, is 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 the is the most important surrogate parameter for as long as we cannot measure or, or detect wall thickness. Some um, by by seven Tesla MR doesn't work. Um, uh, but if you want to hear millimeters, well, I would say seven millimeter is is is, is way too large. Five millimeter makes perfect sense. Um, uh, if, if you have something smaller than, than, five, than five millimeters, but, but you observe aneurysm uh, growth, um, uh, you, you, should, uh, you should consider treatment. Um, if you have um, uh, a patient with significant risk factors in, in those scores um, with a smaller than five millimeter aneurysm, you should still consider treatment um, uh, unless some uh, other parameters um, indicate otherwise. Okay, and the last yeah. Do you use uh, adenosine to facilitate clipping of aneurysms or only in the cases when the aneurysm is rupturing? I have used um, adenosine um, for AVM embolization. And so I, 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 I used some high flow AVMs with, 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 with glue. And when, when, when the, the heart stopped, I injected the glue. So I played with, with, with pressure and then the adenosine. So I, bottom line, I, I like it. Yeah? Uh, and then uh, we are we are trying to 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 set up this, um, but we have never used it. Neither neither pacing nor nor adenosine. But I, I think it's very reasonable, of course. Well, for me, it's the, the period of the low blood pressure is a bit too short if you're in a let's say complicated phase of your surgery. Okay, I do not see any further questions. Um, I look into the chat, and there are many. Um, remarks that they thank you for the very nice, interesting, outstanding presentation. Um, the same holds true for me. So I, I liked your presentation very much. Um, and I'm happy that you have been with us today. And um, I hope that I will have many of the audience again for the next um, year's webinar of the West Coast section. Thanks again and have a nice evening. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye.